Hey guys, we did it. It is officially Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, 13 Nights at Tiki Frights was a success. We've talked to over 13 incredibly talented artists from the Tiki community, and tonight is no exception. It's good to see everybody popping in. Happy Halloween. I, uh, I hope everybody's had a, a good start to the weekend um, and has had uh, an opportunity to do some fun Halloween things. Tonight's the last night, guys. 13 Nights of Tiki Frights, um, and it's a good one. Uh, we're giving away probably, I think a lot of people would say our best giveaway yet. These uh, Club 33 Haunted Mansion inspired Tiki busts. Check those out. We're giving away these at the end of the live stream. We're also giving away the Enchanted Tiki Drummer Box, uh, which was a contest for people that would carve pumpkins, pineapples, submit their design, and we've chosen our favorites, and uh, so we're gonna give some prizes out for that as well. But first, we have an incredibly talented artist, uh, Jay from the Lost Idols Company. He sculpted our Bad Kitty Tiki mug, and he's got a whole lot of really cool projects in the works on his own, and I'm really excited to talk to him. So let's see if we can get Jay in here. There he is. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How's it going, Excellent. man? Excellent. Good. How are you? It's good. It's good to uh, to actually talk to you for the first time. Yeah, we've worked on a mug, obviously. I know, right? But and I've never talked to you. First time we've actually person. talked. It is crazy how many people I have talked to over the course of the past thirteen nights that I've talked to for months and yet never had an opportunity right. to to talk with in person. So this has been a really cool experience for me. Awesome. Yeah. Although. Dude, I, I have a bone to pick with you. Uh-oh. I'm kind of setting you up here. But uh, yeah. on uh, Instagram, okay? Yeah. I'm always on Instagram. You're a busy dude. You post on your stories all the time what you're up to. So I know you're busy. Yeah. But somehow, every time I go to like a post, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. It says, Lost Isles Co. has already liked this post. Is it already like, what? You've already liked it. Oh. You beat me to every post. <laughs> Sorry, I guess that's, uh, I don't know. I check in between because I'm like, I'm in working all day because I like post everything. Yeah. Um, and so like in between like posting time lapses, I'm always like just scrolling the feed or whatever. Um, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how you find the time, but literally every time, I don't like post that often. I probably should like post more frequently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Cause I just have the habit of scrolling, you know? Right. I'm not really like interacting too much, which shame on me, but every time I go to like a post, <laughs> you've already beat me to it. Even it'll say like posted two minutes ago. And I'm That's like, funny. really, really? There's, I'm trying to think there's probably like, like Oak Wash is always beats me. He's the guy I always see first. Oh, really? Like this, yeah, yeah. I don't know how the, uh, the, the Instagram algorithm, like, it picks somebody to put first, right? It yeah. picks, like, some name to put first. I don't know who it decides, like, someone you know and a bunch of other people. So, I don't know. We should do some research on that. <laughs> I, uh, it's it's got to be, like, maybe someone that you've interacted with the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe because we talked so much through Instagram for the, the Bad Kitty Tiki mug, it's like, Lost Idols go, like, yeah. a, every single time. Anyways, happy Halloween, dude. Happy Halloween? There's nothing Good going on here. I don't know if there's anything going on where you're at. Not really. Yeah, I, uh, it's dead. I'm just about to drink some rum. I had to choose this one because... Nice. Massachusetts. Yeah. Have you been there? I haven't. Have you? Oh, they're like uh, 15, 20 minutes from us. Um, and they... I don't know how often they're opening the tasting room with all this stuff going on. Okay. Um, they were doing curbside a lot, and I think they might have opened it for a little bit, but it's, it's awesome. Uh, it's, it's such a great place, and all of their rum is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, so, yeah, it's super, it's super good. We were out uh, last October uh, to Smuggler's Cove for the first time, and it was funny that the bartender there knew Maggie, the, the head uh, rum maker at, at, uh, at Privateer and was like raving about her. And we're like, yeah, it's 20 minutes away. It's like right up the street. So yeah, it's they make such good stuff. Their gin. Have you tried their gin? No, their gin is amazing. It's okay. absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. So if you can track some down, they, they do like a small batch once a year, um, which I think they did. I think they do it like springtime usually. Okay. Um, 
it, it's so good. It's so good. It's interesting that you say that about Smuggler's Cove, because I went there, it would have been February. Because yeah. I went to the, uh, the, the Chinese New Year Parade in San Francisco, which oh, now, cool. <laughs> looking back on that, the timing was kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, it worked out okay. But when I went to Smuggler's Cove, I went down into the basement, and Martin Kate was there. And oh, cool. uh, he had a rep from one of the islands talking about okay. rum. Um, because, of course, Smuggler's Cove has one of the largest collections of rum. It's crazy. And I guess that dude knows, like, so many different yeah. uh, rum companies. Yeah. And I, I finally, because I love the Smuggler's Cove cookbook, I went up to one of the bartenders. And I'm like, hey, do you think it would be inappropriate, like, if I went and interrupted Martin Kate so I could just, like, say hello? And, and he's like, no, you're giving him a compliment, so it's okay. <laughs> he seems like a pretty chill dude. He seems like he was – so did you get to talk to him at all, or – yeah, briefly. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He seems like he would be pretty okay with it. He seems like a pretty relaxed guy. Yeah. I'm not usually the one that would, like, go up to someone and kind of yeah. interrupt, but I'm like, the whole reason I flew to San Francisco was to go to Smuggler's Cove. Yeah, yeah. I go downstairs, yeah. and Martin yeah. Kate is at one of the tables next to me. I'm like, eh, ridiculous. I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely would have. I absolutely would have. That, was, that, was, that book, actually, uh, we bought our house, like, about four years ago. And that okay. book my sister bought as a housewarming gift. And that's what kind of started this whole thing for me. <laughs> so like if I really? saw him, I would have been up to him too. I would have been like, look what you did. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you, he, he kind of sets a lot of people up on that. He path. does. Yeah, I don't know how that book has managed. Well, it's an incredible book. Yeah. There are a lot of incredible books though, but that one in particular has just gotten so yeah. much traction. Yeah. And uh, it's, I, it's a gorgeous book. It is. The illustrations are Atomic Kitty. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and there's, I mean, there's people all through that that like when I, when I bought the book and you're flipping through and you see all the pictures of, of, of folks and you have no idea who they are and now they're all people I've talked to, which is weird. <laughs> so it's it like people I talk to on a regular happens. basis and they're like, oh, wait, that dude's in the book. So it's, yeah, it really, uh, it, it, was the, it was the start for a lot of people, I think. At least recently, you know, there's there's a bunch of us that are new to the game. So it's uh, there's a whole influx of new people who I think that that Martin sent. And I will say that book has gotten me to. Uh, first of all, I, I bet the people at the liquor stores like they know when they see someone in the room aisle <laughs> with a Smuggler's Cove book, like, leave them alone. Yeah, they're going to be numbering these bottles and I want nothing to do with it. Get out of here. That's yeah, probably true. Depends on the liquor store. If you're like Cappy's, probably yeah, they don't want to have anything to do with you. <laughs> oh, I I have to go to your neck of the woods because in New Hampshire, I mean we don't have tax on alcohol, so everybody comes here. But we have Captain Morgan and Bacardi, and, and that's it. Okay, it's it's all state-owned liquor stores, right? Or yeah, they're all still? yeah, they're yeah, all state-owned. State yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. yeah. So at least we got some variety. You have to pay tax on it, but at least yeah. you get to, to buy yeah. the stuff that you actually want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for the most part. I've had to have some stuff. Like, we can't find Deadhead around here right now, which I've had to have shipped, which is, like, through, I don't know if I, I didn't use Drizzly. I used Caskers, um, which was stupid expensive. <laughs> so, yeah, it adds up fast. We go, we like, we're like, oh, we're kind of running out of this, that, and the other thing. And, it, and it's like, you know, a $300 bill walking out of can you, store, so. you, can you get booze shipped to you? Yeah, yeah. Massachusetts has, has loosened up a little bit. Um, we used to, I shouldn't say this, because this, this is slightly, this is borderline <laughs> illegal. Bootlegging? Um, it's okay. But yeah, it's fine. We used to have um, a, a storage unit in California that would store things for you. So we would have stuff shipped there, and then they would ship it from the storage unit. Um, but lately it's been, it's actually been pretty easy. I don't know if, I don't think Massachusetts, um, has changed their like import regulations or whatever. It's such a racket. Uh, I don't think they've changed anything, but they, I think there's a lot of companies that have figured out how to get all the right licenses and all the right permits okay. and stuff to, to import. Like you literally for Massachusetts, we have a friend in, um, in Napa who makes incredible wine, who I think he has like an import license for every state that he needs an import license for. So he has one for Massachusetts, just so that he can ship stuff probably to us at this point. 
Um, so it's, yeah, it's really weird, but it seems like they're, some of these startups are getting better at navigating it. Um, okay. Yeah, because it wasn't a problem for us. It, they might do, like Caskers, I think, outsources. They're like, they find a story in state that has it somewhere okay. and move it around that way. So maybe that's how they're getting around it. So who knows? It is, you, yeah. You don't have access to Lemonheart, do you? Uh, I don't think so. Does no. anyone? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't think so. I've never really looked at it for it because it's always been like, you'll never find it. So I've never bothered. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I can Supposedly ask. what I heard is that it went away and then like it came back, but somebody, even though somebody people said it. they came back, like I still have never seen it. Yeah, no. So yeah. So somebody bought the, the branding and the formula and all that crap. And it's, so it's a completely different maker that put it back into production, Yeah. but I still, yeah, I haven't seen it either. I haven't seen it either. I'm that guy. So same trip when I went to Smuggler's Cove, I brought an extra empty suitcase because you can carry, I, 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 I yeah. think it's five bottles of, uh, of booze that you can yeah. bring. And I grabbed like uh, the St. Elizabeth Allspice Dram. Can't get that here, so I had to get that. Oh, and, really? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's an easy one to find. Not in no. New Hampshire, dude. <laughs> I gotta cross that border. You gotta cross that border. <laughs> so anyways, um, I'm super excited to talk to you. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, and we've talked to a bunch of people this week, but I think only one of them does 3D printing. And that's uh, Big Steaky. Right? Yeah. Big, yeah, yeah. yeah, Mike yeah, Biggs. Yeah. yeah. Um, nobody else does. Obviously, you do 3D printing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people are on social media and whatnot, but Thor is another incredibly talented 3D artist. Yeah. Um, and a couple of months back, he posted this thing about like, Basically, people were frowning upon his work because it was 3D sculpted and not sculpted by hand. Yeah. And so he wrote this long thing explaining like, dude, you guys don't understand how much time and energy goes into a 3D sculpt. Like it's huh. an art form on its own. Yeah, Have you ever encountered like pushback on doing 3D sculpts? All the time. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> oh yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's weirdly controversial. Um, and I don't know, I, I get, uh, there's, there's, there's guys who I will not name to not okay. start any drama, but yeah. like, you know, I get DMs every once in a while who are like, from people you would know, like, why are you doing it this way? Just use clay, et cetera. And, you know, my, my response is usually just like, you, you do what works for you, I'm going to do what works for me. I don't know why that's, uh, for some people there are, they're kind of purists about the process. Um, and, and Thor apparently is running into that. Um, I think Tony gets some of that. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I don't get it. It's like, it's hard enough to create something out of thin air, out of nothing. Like yeah. that's hard enough. However you choose to get there, I don't think matters. I think, you know, uh, it's like, if you get there, uh, don't question the methods. All that matters is the result. All that matters is the more, <laughs> what comes out of it, right? Um, so I don't know. I don't get people there. I mean, I understand people who are like intense about the craft. You know, like yeah. Rodney was is very uh, focused on the craft. He likes the craft, um, and I don't dislike the craft. But he, I think, really likes all parts of of the traditional way of doing that process. Um, I think he's really into it. He really enjoys it for as much heartbreak as it sometimes causes him, it's, it is still one of the things that motivates him to do it. And for me, I just wanted to get a mug out of it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so but, but when you say that, there's a lot of heartbreak in 3D design too. I mean, you well, look at some of your videos of a print that prints yeah, 30 hours failing. and then fails. Yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. that's heartbreak, dude. It is, you know, it is and it's not like at this point, I just, I, I spent 15 years, uh, 15 plus years working in research labs and experiments fail. Like they are expected to fail. They fail all the time. So I'm like, I'm a little bit used to stuff failing. Like that's just sort of part of how I expect things to go. I expect them to work eventually, but I expect there to be a bunch of stuff that's going to just break and not work along the way because I spent 15 years watching people who were trying to cure cancer, like just have stuff never work, you know? So it's, uh, it's kind of ingrained into me is that that's part of 
just it's just part of the process. It's like um, I'm trying to think. This I think it was um, the dude that started Shake Shack, uh, Danny Meyer, um, okay. had this saying: "Fail faster." Like it's it's fine yep. to fail, but fail quickly so that you're learning from it quickly so that you can keep like kind of building and moving forward. And I love that. And it's you know it's kind of it's a big thing that I kind of go back to every time a print comes out of the printer and it's like part of it fell off into the goo. Um, it, that kind of keeps me, like keeps my perspective, you know? Like it didn't work, why didn't it work? You know, just kind of fix it and keep going. Um, it's it's kind of like the same thing uh, Tiki Tom has said before. Um, hmm. And I, th I think it's a common thing in uh, storyboard artists uh, that basically every person has at least 10,000 bad drawings in them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the only yeah, way yeah, to yeah. get to the good stuff is to Yeah, yeah. I think that was an old, I think Milk Cal came, the old Disney animator. I think that was one of his okay. things. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that, that's why, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure he does that. A lot, of, a lot of guys get up, I do when I get up in the morning and sketch, is just get all the crap out of the way. Like, you, you do, you have a million bad drawings in you, just get through them, and then eventually something will will start to click but yeah it's it's a little bit like that yeah and uh even even like mug concepts i mean i probably come up with 40 mug concepts that i wanted people to design and whatnot for me uh, yeah. and like, <laughs> you just throw them away like once yeah. you spent like three weeks thinking about a design if it hasn't like come to fruition for you in your head yeah why, why are you still thinking about it get rid of it and move on to the next yeah. thing yeah it's it's hard to let go sometimes though it's it hard is. to let go you get stuck on it yeah i know i get stuck on i had one a few months ago that i was working on that i had the i had this mug called the skull crusher and i was like oh i want to do one called the bone breaker right to kind of go with it and yep. i i couldn't crack it i couldn't crack it i kept like working on different designs and i actually had it in the printer like okay. starting to print and i was like no no, <laughs> not good. It's not working. It just wasn't clicking. Sometimes it happens and you just got to trash it and, and keep going. Like one of the, the designs that unfortunately I'm not at making the mug yet, but that people really dig is the, the skull crusher, the one with the snake wrapped around the skull. Yep. And like that was, that came out of me trashing a design that wasn't working. Like I was working on something. I was banging my head against it for like a couple months and just everything was terrible. And I had the snake was part of it, right? <laughs> okay. And I was like, all right, well, the snake looks kind of fun. So I'll just use that. And I was literally just in, in the, the software, like messing around. I was like, all right, I'll just wrap them around a skull. I was like, oh, that looks pretty good. So, you know, sometimes you just have to trash it and move on. It's crazy how that happens. Yeah. Uh, you spend it's months lucky. and then the, the next one just comes to you like that. Well, it's, there, there was this great old... Uh, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, idiom, like, like story uh, about a um, Japanese calligrapher who was hired by somebody to paint a crane, like a painting of a crane, right? Yeah. And so he says, go away and, uh, and come back in a year. So the guy comes back in a okay. year and he goes in and, and the calligrapher is sitting there and the guy says, where's my painting? And he picks up his brush and he goes and makes this painting of a crane, like in a second, he gives it to him. And the guy's like, why am I paying for you for this? This took you like 30 seconds to do. And so he gets up and he goes to his closet or whatever, and he opens it up and like a hundred paintings of cranes come falling out. It wasn't that one drawing that he was paying for, right? It wasn't that one thing that was at the end of the process. Yeah. It was all the work that went up there. So like, you may feel like sometimes you're not, um, sorry, my cat is attacking the television. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> could, I you have... not, could you not attack the television, please? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's the, all the work that goes into it. You never know all that's useful and probably ultimately is what got you over the hump, even if it doesn't seem like it, you know what I'm yep. saying? It, it, it's, it's all that stuff built up and got something to click eventually. So at least that's, it's, what it's the same thing, you know, when odd Rodney or Oakwash or, or anyone has a big kiln failure, yeah. uh, you know, they don't get to sell those. No, no. That ends up in, in, in the final products. And is, to go to your cat, I have a, I don't, I don't have a place to put like shipping materials. So my dining room, it's like an open concept loft. My dining room is like across from me. Yeah. And it is just shelves now. Yeah. Full of boxes. <laughs> and at the very top, okay, I have 16 foot ceilings. 
Yeah. At the very top is packing peanuts. And there have been like three nights this week where my cats decide on the live stream they're going to hop up to the top shelf <laughs> and slowly <laughs> knock out all the packing peanuts. And like... I haven't wanted to say anything on the live stream, so I'm trying to pay attention. Meanwhile, the cat's just like knocking pack, uh, packing peanuts on the floor. It's brutal. He was halfway up the wall. It was a little hard to, uh, to ignore. <laughs> cats will be cat. Yeah, you, can't, yeah. you can't live with them. You can't live without them. <laughs> well, when you do a, a 3D sculpt and you print it and it fails, mm. how much like material? What is the cost of a, a print? So um, I wish I had, I could tell you exactly. I actually have, because I'm a spreadsheet guy, I actually have a spreadsheet that gives me like tray life. And have, so there's, there's the type of printer I use has, um, I'm trying to think of how to explain it. It prints stuff upside down. I'm sure you've seen this. Yep. It prints stuff upside down. It has a tub of goo at the bottom that it fires a laser through the laser hardened stuff. And it kind of prints and comes up that way. So when you lose a print, you're losing the resin that uh, was, you know, was kind of bonded into a failed piece of a mug. And then you might be losing the tray that holds the resin that the laser fires through because it has like this membrane thing on the bottom of it that can get screwed up. Um, so that together is like $400, um, depending on like how big the piece was that you're printing. Um, but I'm super lucky in that I have like a, I have like the gold service contract on my printer okay. and, um, the last three or four times that's happened, they've just sent me new stuff. Um, okay. so they're there. So this is a, a company in Cambridge. It's like three dudes from MIT that started it. Okay. Um, Form labs. They're they're The printer, it's expensive. Um, but for like, for the quality that it gives you at that price range, it's actually like a steal. Um, but there's the, the, even better than the printer. The printer looks like if Apple designed like a 3D printer, like it's beautiful. Um, the, like the shipping bracket that holds the thing together is beautifully designed. But even beyond that, their service is unbelievable. Like you email them and they're like, here's what you, we need you to do. Do this, do that, do the other thing. Send us these pictures. They walk you through, they troubleshoot it. And if after like corresponding with you three times, they haven't fixed it, they just replaced your supplies. Okay. Um, we bought one of these at my, at my old job at MIT before I left, we bought one to print spare parts with for the lab. Yep. And when one of them went down, they just shipped us another one. I was like, it's not working. The next day there was a printer there. And I just took, put the broken one in the box and took the old one out. <laughs> like they're unbelievable. So like, it it can be expensive. It has been expensive in the past. Lately, they've they've been like super nice and and, and helping me out, um, and also helping me figure out why it failed. Um, so I don't think it's going to be happening a whole heck of a lot anymore. There's yep. I'm like when I run into these things with with I'm like a power user of everything, um, so I tend to find all of the problems first. Uh, okay, and and so for this thing, they were like. Yeah, so it turns out if you're trying to print cylinders, it's not really good. And what is a tiki mug? You know? So, but nobody else has kind of run into this before because nobody's printing stuff like this at this size. Um, so, yeah, I tend to run into all the problems first, I think. Uh, but Again, yeah. get them out of the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I, you know, I think at least we know what's going on now, which is cool. Actually, um, um, Frankie was telling me that when, when I was trying to figure out what was going on with that, um that he worked and i hope i hope he's i'm allowed to say this i don't i don't think he's under like an nda or anything for this sorry but he, he, yeah he had worked on a uh i think like a bugs bunny and daffy duck costume that they were doing out of they were doing like a with a five axis cnc thing right that, that carves yeah. the thing from all the angles and bugs bunny's cheeks kept collapsing and it it was the same sort of thing it was this this convex area that didn't have enough support and the layers would like shear off and whatever. Um, so he was giving me some, some uh, advice about that. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's um, hopefully it won't happen anymore. Hopefully we haven't figured out. We'll that, see. That probably looked horrific. Uh, Bugs Bunny, like. Oh God. I can't yeah, <laughs> imagine what yeah, that would look yeah. like. No, that would be, that would be, yeah. Yeah, it's bad enough when I print something 
if it's in the printer and the face like shears off of it, that's, yeah, freaking me out. Bugs Bunny's collapsed cheeks would be bad. When you, so supports, right? Like you, you print out a 3D thing. It doesn't really yeah. look like the 3D thing because it's got all these, there's got to be a word the for scaffolding it. The supports, yeah, yeah, yeah. scaffolding. Yeah. yeah. Is that auto-generated? Like you do your sculpt and then the program creates the scaffolding or? Um, it, both. You can, it does generate it, generate it automatically. You can also go in and do it manually or you can have it generate it and then kind of go in and mess with it. Yeah. Um, but it is not, that's one of the things is that the, it's not super good at necessarily analyzing where that scaffolding needs to be. So that's why stuff fails sometimes is because is the software didn't get it right. Um, yep. it's one of the options. They don't know everything with how this stuff works because there's like, there's like crazy microphysics involved in this. Uh, and the software is like super good, but it can't account for everything. So when I, I, I try to mess around with it because you want it, the, the little pieces where it, um, attaches you wind up having to sand down and fix later right mm -hmm. and you don't want to do that you don't want as little of that as possible but whenever i mess around with trying to use less and less supports that's when stuff fails so i wind up with like 100 million percent supports put them everywhere <laughs> I'll, I'll sand it off later i don't care so um so lately is there I've just been auto generating it now is there any downside to like adding too much supports other than the cost of material uh, just just clean up, you know? Uh, yeah, it doesn't, it honestly doesn't add like a lot of time to printing it. It doesn't use okay. that much more material, to be honest. Uh, it's just cleaning stuff up. So I've gotten better at that. Um, so, yeah. One thing that I was talking about with uh, Taboo Relic, since you mentioned him, um, yeah. is that you you can actually, it takes some work, it takes some perseverance, but you can, once you sculpt something in monster clay, you make a mold, you technically mm -hmm. can make another plaster mold from it. Yeah. It takes work, um, yeah. but it's possible. Yeah. When you're making molds out of your 3D prints, how much damage does that do to the 3D prints? Um, it depends on how thick you make, because you print them hollow. Um, yeah. Because if you were to print it solid, it would be like liquid gold. <laughs> it, would, it would take weeks. It would take weeks. And the the thing with the resin, you'd have to keep swapping it out. It would take forever. So you print them hollow. Um, so it depends on how thick you make the wall. Um, the Moai that I've been working on, um, I printed it really thin because I again I was messing around to see with like how much resin would it use. Will it take less time? Yep. The answer is no. Probably I should have just printed it thicker. Um, it it cracked one of the pieces when I was taking it out of the plaster. Um, but the, all the stuff that I've printed with a thicker wall, I could keep making molds from them indefinitely. Like okay. it's, cause it's plastic. You know, the, the, the plaster is gonna rip before the plastic is gonna rip most of the time. Um, so yeah, lately I've been printing with a much kind of like thicker plastic. Um, so you could just, yeah, you could keep reusing it if you wanted to. What I'm trying to get to that I messed around with some, but I don't have a big enough printer, is just printing the molds. Um, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> I'm working on it. Printing the molds for the ceramic mugs? Printing the, the master mold in silicon. Okay, so that, See, you that, just... that was gonna be my next question, because yeah. if you can reuse 3D prints, yeah. why go through the process of creating that master mold if you can just make well, I guess making plaster molds takes a lot of time. So that would Yeah, well, up. so like if you could, the problem is that you have to print the mold, the plaster mold has to be porous, right? So to get that, you have to print the negative. Does that yep. make sense? So you can't, you can't print in plaster. You need something that you're going to be able to pour the plaster into to hold that shape. So you could print the, the silicon. Um, so whenever we make a mug, if you're, if you're producing more than 20, 25 of them, yep. you have to make a silicon copy of that first mold that you make. Right. So you take your prototype, you make your mold in plaster, and then you pour silicon over that so that you have a negative that you can then make a bunch of plaster copies with. Um, in theory, again, I haven't got, got it to work yet because I don't have a big enough printer. You could just print the silicon master mold and then just keep pouring plaster into it forever. Um, what do you, what do you, would that be more expensive though? No. Given the price that you told me before? No? No. Yeah, no, because silicon's expensive. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah, silicon's expensive. 
Um, and the stuff, the elastic resin, I think actually, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think it degrades as fast as silicon does. Silicon has a shelf life. It's not like a short shelf life, but it won't last forever. Um, this stuff is, the way they do it is, it's basically half rubber, half plastic. Um, yep. so, so it has a longer kind of shelf life. So you could run it for a long time. Um, and I don't know, I've done calculations on like with the volume on what it would cost or whatever, but the fact that sil like to do silicon for one small mug, it's like 400 bucks, easy. Um, you could, yeah, you could print a mold for that. That's why a lot of artists, uh, for people watching that don't know this, when they sell like the artist proofs on um, eBay, yeah. oftentimes it's to cover the cost of the materials making the silicon mold. Yep. And then yep. that way, the overall price of all the other mugs can come down because yep. yep. they don't have to put the silicon into the... Yeah, into the that's why I mug. did, that's why I did like, um, I was, you know, for this first real release, like I spent... I've only sold like 12 bucks, honestly, at this point, which okay. is funny that I'm on here with you. I've sold that's not true. That's nah. not true. Because not? Bad Kitty sold out. Oh, that's true. That counts. That's true. That's now, true. We, did, we did save some yeah. for breakages and also just to release when the mug comes out. Yeah, but that was yeah, an yeah. addition of 500. That went like that. That's pretty See? good. You, that's pretty good. But that was, a three person, that was a three person uh, collaborative thing. You know, yeah. this is, this is, it, we're saying it's just me. Um, this, the, the first mug I did, I was talking to, to Omar and I was like, I'm not sure, like, should I put the money into the silicon? Like, should I bother with that? Should I just make 20 of these and, and whatever? Yeah. And he was like, you know, just do a pre-order and see what happens. And I was like, you know, all right. I, you know, a lot of people, and I am still a little uncomfortable with that because you're like asking people to put money up for something that they're not going to see for a little while. And so I just did it. I was like, whatever, I, I want to see what happens, right? Yep. I, want to, I want to get the information. I want to see how people respond. I want to see what the demand is. I just want to see, you know, if people care. I want to see what happens. And I was like, if I sell, you know, 20 of these, I'm happy because that covers the silicon. And then I can at least make some more and I can sell them as I go and, and, and uh, you know, make them as I go. And that worked. But, you know, so that's, it's like doing the artist groups. That's what I wound up doing. I don't think I'm going to do it again um, just because I, I feel bad keeping people waiting for that long. Um, yeah. But it is, it's, you know, it was, I think a lot of people who ordered it uh, understood that they were helping out essentially, you know, helping to, I to think get there. Everybody has their own different opinion on pre-orders. Yeah. My personal opinion um, is they are excellent when someone is just starting out, which is why we did pre-orders for Bad Kitty. And yeah. then once you've made a certain amount of mugs, yeah, maybe there's a time where you kind of graduate from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have more time under your belt yeah. and you don't yeah. do the pre-orders anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah, they kind of yeah. serve their purpose and then people outgrow them. Yeah. Well, I think it, it, hopefully if you get to a point, like it's, it's expensive for the materials, especially when you're first starting out. But I think like, you know, this, this first mug, I sold, um, I think I'm at like 55 or something. That's more than enough to make it worth it for me and cover all the supplies. And if yep. I'm able to, to do just that going forward, you know, I can cover that cost. It's not a big deal. So I like, I don't feel like I need to do that going forward, but I'm super glad that I did, you know, cause it did, it got stuff rolling. So I don't know. Another thing kind of on a similar note I want to ask you about. Yeah. You did glazed tiles. Looks like you're kind yeah. of getting away from glazed tiles. Yeah, they, the, for, for a couple of reasons. The, the main one is that they're, I wish I had one here, is that they're flat. Yep. Um, so, you know, they lay down like that and um, it doesn't, glaze doesn't run a lot, but it runs a little. Um, and that does affect how it lays down. Um, and so I'm going to, I made, that's the nice thing about 3D printing is that I can take any of my designs and print them like that big and then make a little bitty mold and uh, have little bitty versions of the mugs that I can test out the glaze on. Um, so actually I'm gonna switch over to that. It was a combination of that of them being flat and the details being too fine because like when you're sculpting in 3D, you can put in more detail than the printer can handle. Okay. So, some, so some of the details were too fine to how glaze on a full-size mug is really gonna lay down. Um, 
the because so like what what Omar does and what I do with the glaze finish, I'm sure Frankie does it too, um, is we do a hand wipe to get off, like yep. to, so the color sits in certain details. And with the details being too fine, I kept pulling the glaze out. So it wasn't staying in the details. And I was like, ah, oh, it was super frustrating. And that first little, my like training wheels mug that I did, the details were really fine like that. So I had to go back in with a brush and paint in like all the little details again to get it to look even a little bit right. So with the, the mug that I'm working on now, I made sure that the details were really like big and deep so that like the glaze would just sit there. And if I was going to wipe over it, it would still sit there, you know? Um, so it's, yeah, the, it's, it's a little bit of a function of them being flat and a lot of function of how I apply the glaze because I want to get a certain look. Yeah. You said uh, the your designs can be more detailed than what actually prints out. Mm -hmm. Does the computer give you a warning or you just <laughs> kind of be disappointed once it's printed out? No, um, you you eventually get to a point where you figure out like how many it's it's I don't know how much you know about. I got into all this stuff um, with the intent to do like video game stuff. So with, with 3D models, there's what's called poly count. It tells you how dense it is, how many polygons it's made out of. Yep. And um, that is like, you want that to be really low for video games because stuff's moving around and the camera's already moving around. And, and um, every time something moves, the computer has to recompute all those points in space. Yep. So with the 3D sculpts, you can get them up to like, like a video game model, like of a character is like 5,000 polygons, right? Um, a 3D sculpt, when I started doing them, was like 6 million. So my computer was like chugging. Um, and chugging for no reason, because that detail wouldn't show up when you printed it out, because it's a scale thing, right? Yeah. If it's this, if you're printing it out six feet tall, you, you want it to be that detailed. If you're printing it out, you know, yeah, 125 exactly. centimeters tall, you don't need all that detail. It's gonna shrink. It'll still sort of be there because the layers are like 0.25 microns tall. Like it'll still technically be there. Like I printed a little version of the skull crusher that you can actually see all the little cracks and dots on the skull, even though it's that tall. Um, but there's no point in really doing that. And you're not gonna um, be so, able to get the glaze to, yeah. Or, yeah, it's just worth it. So like, so, I figured out like what the sweet spot is for me is like one and a half, two million or whatever. That's the right size. That'll print out. So that's kind of what I keep everything at. Okay. Um, because it's, yeah, it's, you can do more, but, but yeah, the computer won't tell you. It's, that's something you just have to figure out by printing it and trial seeing and what happens. Yeah. Trial and error. Fail fast. Yeah. Goodbye. 300 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Try again. 400. 400 bucks. <laughs> You have posted on your Instagram in the past the or floated the idea of possibly doing like shot glasses of your mugs. Is that still in the works or? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I'm gonna make, I don't know what the market is for shot glasses. Like, I don't know if people want them. Like you, I have- a, You got one sale. You got one. <laughs> that's not gonna do you much. <laughs> I, I have a couple, one. but like, they're just decorative. Like I don't use them for anything. You know, yeah. like I have, if I wanna have, um, you know, like I want to taste rum. I have like a rum glass that has like a bell and a little divot to aerate it at the bottom or whatever. I don't know what you use a tiki shot glass for. I don't know. So I, I like. The, I mean, the, what do people use pop vinyls for? <laughs> <laughs> there are people that have know. hundreds of them, and yeah. it's like they yeah, literally I serve zero. I don't purpose. know. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, don't get me started on that. <laughs> um, but the ones that I'm doing for um, for what's replacing the test tiles are about that size. Okay. So yeah, so we could see how they turn out. The thing that I was I was thinking about doing instead of that, because what I, I want to try and get this idea of printing the silicon mold, the master mold to work, right? Mm -hmm. But I need something that's going to fit. So I was actually thinking about doing a jigger, uh, like a ceramic jigger. Um, yes, because that would fit and it would be about the same size. So like the only interest in doing a shot glass for me would be to try and figure out technically, can you just print the master mold? That's, that's the only reason I would do it. 
Um, and, and I got to a point where it was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I might as well do it for something that I would actually like, <laughs> as opposed to something that I would just not use. You know, you get it. And, and also, if you're offering something to people to say, hey, would you like to buy this thing that I made? You kind of have to believe in it a little bit. I don't know. If yeah, I'm it helps that. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it helps a little, bit. a little bit. Yeah. So, so yeah, the shot glass thing, I have a design for, not shot glass, the, uh, the, the jigger, jigger thing. I, I have a design for um, that I am going to try at some point. I've just got like so much stuff to get through on the schedule at this point that it's, you know, I don't know, next year, late sometime, maybe. Yeah, you're out to like February or March. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, cause the, you know, as I'm getting more, um, experience doing this, I'm getting a little bit of a handle on my schedule. So hopefully having more realistic goals, but yeah, I'm about to, I think I'm about to March. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, speaking of which, uh, yeah. Mr. Moai, yeah. December 15th, is that still a possibility? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because he's, um, there's, so one mold is done. So I know that the mold, I, that's another advantage of doing stuff in 3D is that I can plan out the molds in 3D. Um, okay. even, even if I build them, like I'm gonna wind up building the mold for this just with clay, the old fashioned way, right? Um, but I can still say where the pieces of the mold are gonna be and check in the computer for undercuts and make sure, okay, that's gonna work out. And it's been like, a 95% success rate with planning the molds out that way. Mm. Um, so the mold for this guy, I don't like the first mold that I did, but I know that he pulls. I know that there's no undercuts. I know that all the details pick up um, and I reprinted what's going to be the final version. Um, so that should be good to go. And that's, that's like what I was talking about with, with pre-orders, not wanting to do them anymore. This guy, um, I'm working on the molds now, actually, um, will be ready to go. Like, not all of them, but a lot of them will be ready to go when the order's open. Um, yep. So that'll be a nice transition to make. But, but yeah, it's, it's, I, it turns out I wind up doing, like, for every mug, I wind up doing a test run and doing, like, 25 mugs <laughs> off of a mold that don't work. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay. And then I start over again completely. You know, new print. Another four hundred dollars, new plaster, new everything, but it saves you know it saves time and frustration and whatever um, when you get to the production part of it, I guess. So, but yeah, it should still be. We're on schedule for everything. I've got most of it worked out. I've got the glaze actually worked out um, at this point too, which is. Have you gotten the? Uh, so the one thing? I like the most, uh, if you still end up doing it, is that yeah. kind of like lava. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that's yep. that's this one. Um, so I want to get the, uh, I didn't, the way I put it on, I don't love. So that's just one of the things that you learn over. Yeah. Like, I, I want to say that, uh, like Henrik was saying that, um, I hope, I hope people don't mind me using their names because like their handles, I just feel is a little, I don't know. doesn't feel like I'm dealing with people. I have that Dan same Tiki. thing with, uh, Tiki Diablo. Yeah. Because everybody calls him Danny and like, yeah. I haven't talked to him in person, but I message him and I'm always yeah. like. Can I call you Danny? Like, yeah. I feel weird calling you Danny. But yeah, I, anyways, I, Henrik. I guess I should ask people, but like, I, you know, I don't want to, like, I don't want to be overstepping, but at the same time, Henrik is his name and he's like a super nice guy and I don't want to yeah. be calling him like, you know, whatever. Um, I even forget where I was going with that. The, um, so the, yeah, the glaze on these guys, um, they, I want to get like the red to pop more. Um, but mostly, yeah, he's, he's, he's good. Like I want the red to be brighter and like how I apply it. I want to be a little better. Um, but it should, should work out. The, the other thing I've been trying to figure out is how to get it done in like two firings. Yeah. In, instead glaze, of, glaze firing yeah. Them. Instead of, instead of like, if, you, if you've seen like the Lalo mugs that Omar has been working on, yep. I think, I think those are like four different firings at least oh, really yeah um and they look amazing but man that's a lot of time if anyone there. knows the answer to this question it would be you have you calculated mm -hmm. uh how much it costs to run your kiln for a uh yeah for what for so like for, a, for like a firing for a bisque fire which is 12 and a half hours it's six dollars and 73 cents that's not bad it's not bad. 
no. So yeah, so that goes into my little cost per unit calculation. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's it's not bad. It's this is one thing that that Henrik was saying that uh, when he was living in Hawaii, I think he wanted it cost him like thirty dollars a fire or something, just because of electricity costs out there. So obviously in in Oregon it's much cheaper, but um, we're uh, electricity in my town is like dirt cheap. So yeah, it's it's pretty inexpensive. That part of it's not a big deal. So when people are like. Oh, why? Like, I would fire like a mug, like one mug, <laughs> right? Just to see what happened. And, and I would have some people who've been doing this for a while who, you know, they know what they're talking about. But they're like, why are you doing this? This is such a waste of, of money. I'm like, it was six bucks. It, it's not that. <laughs> Honestly, it's probably better that than to make 10 mugs and then have all 10 fail. Yeah. Or explode. Because your time is worth more than $6.50 yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's it's labor is is you know is two thirds of everything, right? It's the time that you put into it is where everything goes. The the stuff itself doesn't cost um, very much. It's you know if you see me every day sanding <laughs> mugs endlessly, that's that's where everything goes. That's where everything goes. I think Diablo was saying this to me today. Was that like that? Yeah, that labor. It's like plaster is cheap labor is is where all the money goes and it is uh you know for me i'm one guy so i can afford to like you know cut rate sweatshop my salary but uh, <laughs> you know it's i i'm who's gonna who am i gonna complain to um yeah but that is you know how did that that brings up a good point though because yeah. you you were working was rit was it in the, like research and development uh, no, so I was at uh, MIT, Massachusetts MIT. Institute of Technology okay. in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, MIT. Okay, so. So I was at a, a place that um, uh, called the Broad Institute, which I don't know. It's on the news in Massachusetts all the time because it's turned into like the COVID testing center, um, which is just really funny. Um, oh boy. Yeah. Right. Um, you got so, out. Hey, they're they're doing they're doing a lot to help the hospitals down here, which is a big deal, but. Um, but yeah, so I worked there uh, managing like like 15 cancer research labs, um, something like that. I lost track of how many there were um, for a while. Don't ask me how I got that job. I dropped out of art school, so it was a weird career <laughs> trajectory. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh, it was interesting. It's interesting. Like what I'm doing now is completely different, but I carried over a lot of the methodology, like a lot yep. of the stuff that I learned in just how to kind of rigorous, rigorously approach something and, and figure it out consistently, like I held on to. So it's it's funny in the studio, I have stuff. I have the rubber gloves I used to use in the, use in the lab. I have these little lint-free wipes that I used to use in the lab. Like there's all the stuff that I started working there and it was like, you know what I need? I need this thing that we used to use in the lab and then I order some. So. It's it's funny that uh, the we I used to talk about this with guys uh, at the old job all the time the the thought process between research scientists and artists is very similar we're all just throwing stuff at the wall to see what will work and expecting that it's not going to work most of the time so it was really the 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 I guess the type of creativity yeah uh, is similar. You know, so which that's interesting because you normally think of those two things being polar opposites, but yeah, uh, not not at all, no. not at all. It's yeah, it's super super similar. Okay, so you're you're working here. Um, your trajectory, I don't know if that'd be the right word, but mm. um, is very different than a lot of artists in that they kind of work part time. Yeah, for a while, and then they decide to go full. You just went full on, right? Yeah. So we we I had. Um, I had decided to leave my job at MIT um, about six months before I did. Um, I had, I was getting ready to leave because it was just time for me to go do something else. That's, that's all it came down to. It was yep. time for me to go. I went to art school. I could never figure out what I wanted to do with it. Like I was like, you're in high school. You're like, I'm an artist. And then you get to art school and you're surrounded by all these people who are artists. And you're not special anymore. And you're not very good anymore. And I just, I, you know, I dropped out. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with it. So I never stopped. But like, because you don't just stop being an artist. Yeah. Um, but 
I, I was never focused enough to figure out what I wanted to do with it. But the drive was always there to do something, but I could never figure out what it was going to be, right? So we, I think I mentioned, we bought this printer and worked to print spare parts, right? I was like, yep. I think I can figure this out. We had this thing that we used, right? That <clears throat> um, it was a, a piece of lab equipment. It was about that big. It cost almost $700. It's made out of plastic. There was a little part of it on the end that kept breaking because it would, it, they would run bleach through it and it would just break down. It would just disintegrate. Okay. And you couldn't buy the part. You had to buy the whole thing again for six, $700. And I was like, all right, well, we can get some calipers. We can measure this thing and build it in, in the computer and just print it out for 51 cents. So I was like, okay, we can do this. Can we buy a printer? Yes, yeah, so you can buy a printer. So we bought the printer and I'm printing out these spare parts for the lab. And then I'm like, all right, now it's just sitting there. What else can I do with it? Eh, I'll make some tiki bucks. Why not? Why not? <laughs> and, and that was at the point where it was like, you know what? I need to go do something, right? I've, I've had this desire to make something, but I could never figure out what it was. It might as well be this. And, you know, that was the point where I decided, I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to go do it. And then like a whole bunch of stuff happened at work and I was going to leave. And they said, can you stay for another year? And I was like, all right. And that situation got a little tenuous because I was just, without getting too much into like how MIT and research stuff works, it was, um, there are egos as you would okay. probably expect. And I was just, I was dumb. Um, so we had figured out, luckily my partner Gretchen is like a math genius and was like, okay. listen, if you cash out, you have 13 months to get this to work. And I was like, all right, I've been listening to NPR. This is in December. I've been listening to NPR. There's this virus happening in China. It doesn't sound good. So we got to February and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> this doesn't look good. I got stuff to do. I'm out of here. Uh, and that was, you know, luckily we were in the place where we had the money set aside that I had the time to figure this out. Yeah. Um, Cause otherwise, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, Omar was, was, I don't know how that dude was doing it. I don't know how that dude was doing it. He was like working a full-time job, raising like 16 kids and then like, <laughs> and then like coming home and working until like four in the morning, making mugs. And, and he's and still like, the happiest dude ever. Right. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and was doing it. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. Um, but he, he knew, I think, uh, obviously it was a big decision for him, but he knew at the point that he decided to go full time that it was viable. Um, yep. We kind of went the other way and just said, you know what, well, listen, like I have like probably my biggest strength and also greatest weakness is that I'm really bad about thinking about the future. Like if it's, 1155 and you ask me what I want for lunch, that's too far in the future. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I don't worry about stuff like that, but, but luckily Gretchen figured out, okay, this is the, you got 13 months. And I was like, I'll make it work. And luckily it's been working. So it was, uh, it was a reasonable decision. It turns out in hindsight. I just, dude, I, there's going to be a, 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 like a, a moment when people <clears throat> discover you on math. You and think? they're going to eat your stuff like crazy. Your I stuff so. is so unique. It's, it's, I, thank you for saying that. I, I, you know, I try because I like, I don't, like, it's super important to me. And I don't want to take shots at anybody. Um, but it's super important for me to own my stuff and not have it be, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a non kind of uh, catty way to say this, but like to, for it to not be derivative, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I don't want to be doing geeky tikis, you know what I'm saying? Um, so if I get a, like a way, way, way smaller audience because I'm doing stuff that's just what I want to do, as opposed to something that I'm calculating, I think people will like, that's kind of more important to me. Like I want mm -hmm. it to be mine. 
I don't want it to belong to somebody else. I don't want Disney to like call me up and be like, so I saw you were making some Haunted Mansion mugs and I'm going to need you to cut that out. And then the business is gone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I, it's important for me to, for it to be mine, for me to own it. Even if that means like five people like it, it's still, it's mine. Um, hopefully people see that, you know, uh, I would hope so. Um, you know, the, for I me, think right. You, you have, is it four mugs? Is yeah, I've got, well, I've got, I've got the first four actually prototyped. The first two are actually in ceramic. And then I have, I think the five after that, like designs and like at least two of them are almost ready to print out. And so like, yeah, they're down the road. It's just the, the ceramics part of it, I've do, been doing for eight months, you know? So it's like, uh, yeah, that's tricky. I'm trying to get the, the polish. I'm trying to get them to be as polished and as good as they can possibly be. Um, that's, it's the, the craft part of it that I'm, I'm really trying to figure out, you know, the design part of it, I've been doing a lot longer. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's less of the problem. It's, it's learning. I mean, learning these new skills, the, the, you know, two months ago, I had no idea what to do with glaze. Like, no idea what to do. And I, I had somebody DM me like, you're going to fail. It's like, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to mute you for a little while um, and just put my head down and get through it. So it's, it's been a lot. It's been a crash course in everything. Like, before March, I had never built a plaster mold before. Um, it has been a crash course in everything. Um, so, you know, now, like, everything is a little, I think Henrik was talking about this, was like, he doesn't believe in the kiln gods, right? You see a lot of people are like, I'm going to pray to the kiln gods that everything comes up. I don't believe in that either. But there are a lot of, like, weird little things going on under the hood that you're not necessarily going to be aware of that make a mug explode or make glaze not lay down right or whatever, that it's just experience, Right. It's just yep. doing it over and over again and having a reasonable idea of, of you know, how it's going to turn out um, that I just, you know, that's what I'm trying to build up sort of stupidly. But quickly. I would, see, I would say like ceramics is something that you can learn, mm -hmm. um, but a style that your own is like, that's not as easy. Not yeah. that ceramics is easy to learn. I can remember, I don't remember exactly when I started following you on Instagram, but there was a photo that popped up on my feed of one of your later mugs and I saw it and I was like, that's Lost Idols Company. Uh -huh. And I looked up and I saw the name Yeah. and I was right. Yeah. And it's because even you, you have four mugs, but yeah. your style is so distinct yeah. and so different than what the other artists are doing. You can see one of your mugs and know right away, hey, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's, and, that's and that's really cool. And that's, you know, again, thank you for saying that. that. That That is important, you know, and I don't know, it's, it's a little intangible, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's not like, it's not a calculated thing. Um, I remember somebody saying at one point that like, your style is all the things that you, your style is all the things that happen when you're trying to copy something, because as artists, we're all trying to copy something, right? We all see something, we're like, I love that, I want to make that. And you try and copy it, and your style is all the things that you get wrong while you're trying to copy <laughs> it. And and that's that's a little bit true. Is that is that I you know I you, we set out or at least I set out. Some people can just like nail it. Like Thor, when I see his sculpts of Tony's stuff, it's like it's perfect. You just you just nailed it, right? Um, I have to just kind of follow it where it takes me. Um, but there's some stuff like for me that's built into it where it's you know, there's the big Disney influence. There's the big cartoony influence. And and then there's, it's funny that, that some of that stuff is actually, some of the stuff that's the style in the mugs is what, um, what the software does, right? Is that there's some stuff that you can do where like here, so this is, this is the uh, Poison Bottle, the Deadly Dawn mug, right? Yeah. Um, which is, I'm getting ready to reprint a version, undercuts, right? These ropes, not, not gonna happen. Not gonna happen so much. So I've been rebuilding the whole thing and rebuilding the ropes um, and planning the mold so that it will, will come out of the mold, right? Um, but this, um, 
shape it was possible because I had the mug and then there's stuff that you can do when you're, you're sculpting it in 3D that you can just sort of grab it and distort it and pull it off in a direction or whatever. So that's one of the great, that's one of the reasons that I like working, uh, doing 3D sculpting that works really well for me yeah. is that you can iterate and you can just try stuff and say, all right, if I have this design, what happens when I just go mm, and yank it this way? You know, what happens if I twist it? What happens if I squish it? And all of this stuff, because the, the software that I use was made for computer animation, right? It's made to do all this cartoony stuff. It's made to squash and stretch and bend and all that stuff. And when you start applying that to your sculpts, um, it gives this cartoony thing, which just sort of fit with, you know, naturally where my mind wanted to go. Yeah. But it's just lucky that, you know, that once you have something and you like the idea and you like the design, but then you can just start tugging on it and messing with it and, and just trying different things and see what happens. And it's just pixels, you know, you're not, you're not wasting a sculpt. You're not destroying a sculpt that you spent all this time on. Um, it's, you know, it's super easy to just blow through iterations of a design. And you go back. Yeah. You do yeah, it. If you it don't like it, you go back. Yeah, if it doesn't work. Like with the with the grass, where I was like, uh, on the, the bad kitty, I was like, yeah. I think this is going to be easier for the bowl. And you were like, yeah, it doesn't look like grass anymore. I was like, <laughs> it doesn't, but it would be easier. <laughs> but so I was just like, all right, we'll just pull out the old grass. It's fine. Um, so it's, it's, that is the big reason. Like, I was talking to Tony about this at one point, And I was like, they would, he was saying when he and his wife were making the molds originally, they would have a lot of stuff fail, right? And it would destroy the sculpt. Yeah. And that would be the one sculpt that they had. And they had no idea until they popped open the mold. Was the mold good? Was the sculpt utterly destroyed? And most of the time, the, the sculpt would be destroyed and the mold wouldn't be good. And now you've got nothing. And I was like, I can't handle that kind of pressure. I can't handle that kind of pressure. Like, if one of my prototypes got destroyed, I could just print it again. I'm good. It's not a big deal. I've had to do that a few times. Um, yeah, it's, that's, it's a huge advantage. And just for me, like the guys, you know, again, that work traditionally, um, I just, the respect that I have, it's a different, I got to do what works for me. But the fact that they can go through that whole process and not have a heart attack, <laughs> yeah, Van, well, like Van Tiki uh, oh my God. said, he has oh to have God. his wife open the kiln. Oh my <laughs> God, he's too scared. I, you know, I love him so much, and he—I don't know how he gets through it sometimes. Like I was just watching the um, the second part of of the fountain that he's been working on today. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, dude, I don't know how you get through this. That's that whole episode stressed me out. Oh my God, yeah. Like when he was trying to get the uh, the styrofoam, the form underneath out. And he's like, he's trying the, the, the quick clamp. He's trying the, you know, a lever. He's like, oh, no. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like that reality television, you know, where they deliberately try to torture you, except yeah. you know yeah. with Van Tiki, like he's not yeah. doing it intentionally. He's, he's feeling yeah. the same thing times he is. a thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the thing I don't understand with him is that he's so good. He's going to figure it out. It's 99% it's of the time it's going to work. You know, because he's been doing this so long and he's so rigorous and in control of his process. Yep. Um, but still, it, you know, he's just like, I don't know how, I don't know how he gets through it because we can't get through it watching it. We're like. <laughs> I've uh, also, in terms of the 3D sculpt, I, I can't tell you how many people, because I talked to a lot of Tiki people who let me know what's going on with their mugs, just do the mug announcement stuff and, and whatnot. Yeah. And that's really cool. That's probably one of my favorite things to search for Tiki is people kind of giving me <laughs> those insights. Um, but so many people have messaged me saying, we love this mug, but it came out too small. And we're disappointed in the, in oh, the yeah. size it came out. Yeah. That's another plus of 3D sculpts. Yeah. Because ceramic shrinks. If it shrinks, yeah. all you have yeah. to do, print it yeah. a little bigger. You can't yeah. make a sculpt bigger. You yeah. got to redo no. the whole sculpt. Yeah, and that's that's one thing that I, I think so. Like, my printer is smallish, right? Um, like mm -hmm. this is I'm trying to think. This is probably the maximum size that will fit into it, and um, so I have to start splitting stuff up. But I, you know, I haven't been very good at like putting stuff back together and hiding all the seams and cleaning up and all that stuff. Um, 
But now that I'm getting better at that, it, it literally is. You want the mug to be this size. Your clay body is going to shrink 12%. You scale it up 12% and then print it out and you're good. You know almost exactly what size it's going to come out. So like stuff like this, right? So this is the cork for um, the yep. poison bottle mug, which is going to have a straw hole in it. Um, Very cool. And I, I know that that's going to work. I know that it's not going to get fired and shrink and then the straw is not going to fit in there anymore because you build it, you scale it up 12% or a little more just to be safe. Um, and you know it's going to work. It's, it's, it injects some more predictability into the process. As long as you know what you're doing with the slip, like I was, uh, I had my stuff shrinking like crazy, like 40, 50% crazy. Like, I'm, I'm not even kidding you. The Does prototype that... would be this big, the mug would be like that big. The flocculent? Yeah. Yeah. And I had, because I have been doing this eight months, right? And this is one of those things that like, people like Henrik or, or Omar or anybody who has been doing it for any period of time, this is just automatic, right? Yeah. So they're like, I don't know why your mug's shrinking because it never occurred to them that I wouldn't know something this simple. And at one point, Omar's like driving around and he, he video messages me on Instagram from his car and he's like, uh, so dude, I was just thinking about your, the mug shrinking and he went through the same thing. But it was so like automatic to him and probably to everybody at this point that like just didn't occur that like, I would be doing something that dumb. Um, and I was doing something quite that dumb. Um, but, you know, but luckily he, it occurred to him and he was like, here's what your problem is. And, and guess what? That's what my problem was. So there are that so out. many small, like extremely specific things about ceramics. Yeah. 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 You, is, you, you know, have to read so many books and watch like every Vantiki video in order and, to and, avoid all of those mistakes. Yeah, and the stuff has to be like, like, and I've, you know, as much stuff as you read, you, you're trusting somebody to be, like if it's a book, to be super organized in how they lay it out. And sometimes the stuff is just like buried, you know, or, or like doesn't even make sense. Like this, this, I get, this is one of the things that is for some reason as controversial as, as the 3D printing thing, is that I went through um, this whatever process of trying to figure out how I was going to measure a plaster, right? By volume. Okay. Um, because I was always, I would always mix way too much or not enough, right? So you mix not enough and your thing is filled up halfway and then you're like mixing plaster really fast and trying to dump it on. And it's just a nightmare. It just has all in. And when you can have plaster that is like 90% water, as soon as it hits plaster that is already curing chemically, it starts to dry immediately. So it looks mm. like puddles of mud that have like flash dried. So you, you either have, you know, I was running into either having way too little or way too much. And now I have a bucket full of plaster that weighs 60 pounds that I didn't use that's solid that I have to figure out how to get rid of. Yeah. You know, so, so I was like, I wanna know exactly what it's gonna be. And like, you look at what the plaster mixing ratio is. I have a book um, was the first one that I got that is very well, well regarded. And the guy's very, very good. Um, but his like, here's how you figure out your plaster volume. I've decided that if you take this weight of plaster and this volume of water, it will make you a 16 inch by 16 inch cube of plaster. Oh, that's helpful because we're making cubes. We're all making cubes of plaster. <laughs> it's not especially helpful. You know, at a certain point, it's, I'm sure it's like, it's like cooking or it's like anything where you just, you have the experience and you know, you can look at it and you can say, all right, I need this much and I need this much. I'm eight months in, I am not there yet. And I, you know, I can't deal with that kind of uncertainty. So I went through this whole thing where I was gonna figure out, you know, exactly how much um, I was gonna use of each thing to get a certain volume. And it was this huge trial and error process that wound up being oddly controversial with people a lot of a lot of really you know oh yeah a lot of old school people were dming me like this is why are you making this so complicated i was like because i'm new at this and i need it to be predictable <laughs> and like i know you've been doing this 25 years and you just be like you need that much i'm not there yet <laughs> and right now i kind of need it to work and not be like 
running around the studio panicking or throwing away like 60 pound, you know, Home Depot jugs full of, of plaster that have hardened. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, there are so many little details, but they're buried, you know, and, and luckily now it's like, obviously with, with TV, Tiki Technical Tuesday, or with just being able to like, um, so many people on Instagram, Instagram has been like, uh, such a huge help because like just everybody, uh, like all the mug makers are super accessible and super yep. willing to help you. And, and, and Tony was saying this at one point that like when he first started making mugs, he literally had to drive around California and find a dude that made mugs and knock on his door and be like, how do I do this? You know, I, like, tell me, tell me how to do this. Tell me your secrets. And, and now you can just like ask somebody a question or like, you know, like, you know, Omar or Rob or, or Henrik will see me doing something and they'll be like, I think maybe this is what's going on. I think maybe this is what's going on, you know, and, and, and kind of point me in the right direction. Yep. Um, which is just, is just amazing. Like, like nine times out of 10, if there's something, I don't like bugging people, but like my go-to guy is Omar and I'll be like, Hey dude, this is not working. <laughs> like, what do you do? And, and he'll, like, it'd be like, here's what you do. And he's right. Um, so it's like having access to people like that is, you know, it's super new um, for mug making, it seems like. I, it just being able to directly talk to, to guys who have been doing this for a long time and them being just like super generous with their time and with the information, it's, it's awesome. And you're carrying it on, dude. I'm trying, I'm trying. You're sharing all the, the mistakes and the... Yeah. The, the successes that you have on your, your Instagram. I love it. You know, and that's, that's that the, the reason I do that is not like, cause like, I think I know anything cause I, I don't at this point, but it's, I find that I learn um, sometimes more from people who are closer to my level than I do mm -hmm. from, you know, from people who are up here. Like, yep. like, again, like Henrik is like so good at what he's doing and has been doing it for so long um that there's some stuff that he's going to go past in the course of you know showing you how he does something like the deflock you know or like just kind of simple stuff like that um you know that that seeing someone like me who's closer to maybe someone who's thinking about doing it just yep. running into all these problems and screwing everything up and then hopefully eventually getting through it. You know, the part, part of seeing someone closer to your skill level, figuring it out, hopefully is helpful. You know what I'm saying? And, and that you can figure it out. Like it will work eventually. It's not magic. You will figure it out eventually. Um, you know, hopefully. And, and I get people surprising on a regular basis saying that it does help. Them. You know, seeing somebody who is doing something that they want to do, but it's kind of closer where they're at than, than where, because seeing Henrik work is intimidating, right? Seeing how beautiful his molds are, are is yeah, intimidating. Yeah, it, it can be, yeah. It, when uh, you, if you were to make a mold and it came out looking, you know, like swamp bottom, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. yellow and choppy, yeah, you'd be like, yeah, maybe this isn't my passion. Absolutely. And, and like, you know, hopefully seeing somebody who's, who's like, you know, covered in dust and plaster and running around with their hair on fire, but still actually getting through it, you know, hopefully that, that helps uh, somebody somewhere, maybe. It does. And I think it's, it's not just about the, the making of the mugs. It's, it's the appreciation of mugs in general, which I think yeah. is why uh, Van Tiki started doing Tiki Technical Tuesday in the first place. Of course, yeah. helping other artists has been a, a fantastic byproduct of it. But yeah. I think it was more about like demystifying, like, why does this cocktail mug cost $150. I don't yep. understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah that's, what he, that's what he said, right? Is that he wanted people to see how much work went into it. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, stuff's work, but <laughs> um, anything worth doing is a lot of work. But uh, you yeah, want to be on? You want to <laughs> say hi? Hold on. This is, oh. this is he's six months. We've got two rescues in the house right now. This is one of them. He was, when he got here, he was uh, terrified of everything. And now he's in charge of the house. Yep. Are you uh, fostering or forever home? No, no, we, uh, no, just uh, straight up adopting them. Yeah. The one that um, we got one a few days ago, uh, a little girl who was, just came out of a foster house. Um, okay. 
who we're trying to get acclimated now. Um, but yeah, this guy is a character. I, uh, so my, I have a friend of Nora from France who fostered kittens and lived down the street from me. Um, mm -hmm. And I fell in love with one of the kittens she was fostering. So I was going to adopt it. When I, when the cat was going up for adoption, I was in Washington, D.C. Oh, no. So I had to phone a friend and be like, please go adopt this cat, say it's for you, <laughs> and then transfer it to me. <laughs> I don't want to give any names because I don't want them getting in trouble. But there was like a three-day period, <laughs> literally three days, where they had this cat. Yeah. And in those three days, they thought it would be a good idea to play straw with the cat by just tossing a straw and the cat would play with it. Okay. Ruined the cat for me. Oh, no. <laughs> Ruined. <laughs> I, I love him to death. But obviously, <laughs> I use a lot of straws in cocktails and stuff. He <laughs> loves them. He lives for straws. In fact, the live stream today was late because... He does the same thing with ice now because ice has become cocktails. And so I had to talk my cat down before going live because he just would not leave me alone. So a uh, Tiki bar's worst nightmare is yeah, my cat. It would be your cat. That's hilarious. Yeah. Of all the cats for you, why did they do that to you? I don't have know. Have you talked to them about this? I have. And uh, they, every time I bring it up, they're like, yeah, I don't regret it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, thanks. You don't have to live with it. Oh my god. He'll uh he'll play fetch. So he brings the straw to the top of the bed, puts it down in front of you like a dog. You throw it across the room, carries it up in his mouth. I've never seen a cat do that before, but he plays You need fetch. to get some of uh of Andrew's glass straws that'll that'll fix him. No, they were just like Oh, they're really these things are sturdy. I test have it you, out. You think so? Have you, have you got some of his? Surfside no. sips? No. Nope. They're awesome. Um, and you would think, like, people always say, like, glass straws, don't they break? They are, they're like ceramic hard. Like, they're so good. Uh, and and they're they beautiful. come in different heights, too, right? They, yeah, they come in all different heights. He's got some that look like bone. He's got a bunch that look like bamboo. They're, they're awesome. They're super awesome. So definitely check them out. And everybody watching, check yeah. them out. Yeah. All right. So... I got I have some more questions, but we're running over an hour. Are you good or? Yeah, I mean, your Should call. We... I, I got no place to be. You got no place to be? It's Halloween. <laughs> Does anybody have any well, place to be this Saturday year? Saturday night? No, not yeah. really. Yeah. One thing that's been bugging me. Yeah. Um, and this is, again, like I've been doing this a, a fair amount of time, but I still have questions because I haven't made mugs. So I'm sure someone yeah. else has this question too. I was under the impression that glazes could not be mixed. You have proven me wrong. You mix glazes all, right. all the time. Yeah. No, I really. Yeah. See, this is this is one of those things. There's so many things that I do that I am happy that I did, but I probably would not have done if I knew more. Um, so, like, yeah, no, they can be mixed. Yeah, I've I'm not heard sure. so many horror stories of like glazes that don't mix well together. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of glazes are chemically like stupidly complicated. And it depends on, um, <clears throat> I am using glazes that are specifically made and formulated to be mixed. Like that's the point. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's probably, they're compatible chemically. Um, there's a lot of glazes, like there's some mid-range Celadon glazes that lay down beautifully, um, but that you could not mix with anything because the reason that they lay down is how they separate as they, um, what's the word, vitrify, is that right? Um, that they gets you the kind of variation in texture um, and how they maybe lay down in details more or show less on edges or whatever um, that is a part of like what their composition is, right? All the different uh, minerals and glass and, and whatever else uh, that's in them. Um, so there's a bunch of glazes that are made or like chinos that are made to have very specific effects that yep. you can you can layer right but mm -hmm. you can't mix um the stuff that i'm using is all um because i was again this is one thing that i i got a lot of heat from what's up buddy <laughs> um 
from people in that, because I didn't know any better, right? I was like, I want the glaze to look like this. And I would do it in the computer, right? I would render. And it would be like, oh, it's beautiful. And people would be like, you're not going to match that. You know that, right? <laughs> and I'd be like, probably, but I'm going to try, right? So that's why I went towards, because I'm not trying to do anything like you, the volcanic vapor smoke, right? Yep. It has all that on the lava lamp, all that glittery looking, yep. glaze, right? Which is nuts, right? I'm not trying to do anything like that. I'm trying to get like one color <laughs> and like another color over it. Um, but I'm also trying to mix certain colors that I came up with just in the computer. And if there's one thing and probably only one thing that I do well is I'm good at matching colors. Like I'm, I'm pretty good at, at getting the colors um, yeah. to match up pretty well. I don't know if it's just years of working on the computer or whatever. Um, but so I specifically bought places that mix. Like that was that was the point for me. Was, so how did you uh, how do you if you didn't know anything about ceramics? How did yeah. you know which glazes would mix and which wouldn't? Is it listed uh, on the glazes? Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I was looking at um, it will. Yeah, it does tell you like, pretty much any underglaze can be mixed. Um, okay. Because they're they're fired at you know, whatever temperature your clay is firing at. Yep. Um, and then what I've been using is um, Amico's like satin glazes, um, which are like still a little glossy, but not like crazy uh, reflective glossy. Um, and they just, cause they have a nice feel to them too. Um, they don't feel glassy. They're still a little more tactile, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I was like, so I, I want to try those, but then it turns out, they're mixable. It says these glazes are fully mixable. So like everybody like Spectrum or Amico or whatever has uh, a couple of lines that are made to be mixable. Mixable. Like they have a, I forget what they call it. There's like their teacher series, like classroom glazes that are made to be mixable. And especially like low fire glazes, I think there's more lines that are made to be compatible like that because the yep. colors don't get crazy as you go up in temperature. They stay pretty true to the colors. Um, the, the Amico satin glazes that I've been using are interesting because they are mixable, but you fire them at cone six, which is fairly high. And it's at a point which especially bright colors start to get really dark and these don't, and they're still mixable, okay. which is unusual. I, I think Fantiki was talking about this, was saying that like, cause he works at cone six, um, yep. usually, and I think always. Um, in that when he started, there were not as many, if you wanted to do bright colors, you had to do low fire. Um, and that's not exactly the case anymore. So it's just certain, a lot of glazes, um, like if you see glazes for people that are doing thrown pottery, most of the glazes mm -hmm. they're using are not mixable because they have this speckled effects or, or earth, yeah. you know, whatever, like that stuff probably almost never is, but this stuff is just like primary colors. So it's made to be to be mixable. Um, so, but right. it's still a lot of trial and error figuring out how to get them to get, like how much red or blue or whatever do you put in to get the right color, you know? Yep, and you don't know until you fire it. No, 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 no. But um, yeah, that's what that's what the one million little test tiles were for. So it, it worked. I mean, it, it really, it let me blow through, because glaze is not like, it's not, honestly, I don't think it's unpredictable. It's just that there's so many combinations of, of the glazes and how you layer them and how long you fire them. And, you know, is it satin? Is it gloss? Is it an underglaze? Is it an underglaze under satin? Blah, blah, blah. That like all the permutations, it's like, how do you sort that out, right? So I literally had to take the tiles and label all of them and be like, all right, this one's going to be blue underglaze with a gloss over it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then the next one was going to be, you know, flipped. It was going to be, the blue was going to be the top collar and the underglaze was going to be the under collar. And then did that a hundred times, you know, so it's, it's. But then uh, you sold them. Did you take like photos galore? Um, yes, but not good enough. <laughs> so this, <laughs> Yeah, so somebody was like, hey, can I, so I ordered one of the Lolo mugs, can I get it in this glaze? And they sent me a picture of the test tile and I was like, oh crap. I don't remember what I did for that one. <laughs> and so luckily I figured it out because I had one of my dumb Instagram things where I was like, here's my glazes. And I think I did this one 50% this and 50% that. So luckily I had it and I figured it out, but 
Um, there are some of them that I got like super cool effects on. I'm like, not sure how I did that. So, um, but you know, my whole, my whole goal was to get to, do you have one of the Smuggler's Cove, the brown um, uh, sunken tiki's? It's like they're- um, I do. Yeah. So I don't like, know where it is, but I do. So like that one has, um, I love the finish on it, but that was like, you know, it's kind of a, um, a straightforward like hand wipe, right? It's got one yep. color and then another color for the detail. But that one, uh, I'm pretty sure is, because this is what I spent all my time trying to figure out, is a, a brown underglaze okay. um, that's been fired with then a black glaze over it, which is wiped off to just some of the details, fired again. Um, so that's like what I wanted. I wanted that, because if you feel it, the black areas, all the details are glossy and glassy, right? Super yep. nice. And then the brown is rough and has texture. You can almost feel the clay. Um, I was like, that's what I want. And that's what I spent all the time trying to figure out is that was the, the look and the feel that I kind of wanted to capture just with like different colors. Like the, the base color and the top color would be the only thing that changes. I'm not, I was never looking to do anything nuts. I just wanted to kind of like figure that out. Um, and do you that's... think that, that, that brings up a good point though, because yeah. ceramic artists uh, typically are so giving um, of everything, of yeah. their, their, their wealth of information. Do you, would you consider glaze combinations information they would give out or would that be considered like a trade secret? I th for, for me, I will tell anyone anything. Um, I think for a lot of people, they probably hold on to that. I mean, I think that there's, yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's, there's folks that have told me things that they have done or things that they know other artists have done because they've worked with them and said, here's what so-and-so does. Don't tell anyone this, <laughs> um, which has happened a few times. Um, so yeah, that is that, because that's one of the, slightly um, more opaque parts of the whole thing. You know, like the whole mold making and slip casting part of it, people are pretty open with that stuff. But yeah, when it gets to the glazes, people I think get a little cagey about, about you know, how they layer, what order they layer in, how many times they fire, um, you know, how people get their clear top coat on, on stuff that's just under glaze, et cetera. Yep. Um, so that's why I was like, yeah, I just want, I want to figure out this one thing because that's kind of all I need. Because I literally, when I, when I pre-visualize stuff in the computer, I have this little thing that has a slider. And it's like, put color in the details, put color on the mug. That's all I'm trying to get. You know, I'm just trying to match those two things. So, um, but a lot of that was technique. It was like how, this is like what I was saying, like I hope Omar's not going to get mad with me um, for how many times he has to fire some of the mugs because of how he does layers of, of, glaze application to get it to sit exactly how he wants it in the details. Yep. Um, you know, that's like nuts. Like the, the, the lengths that he goes to, to get exactly what he wants out. And I was like, I want to fire my mugs twice, like twice would be good. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, luckily with, with underglaze, you can fire that right on to greenware, right? Um, so now that I have this worked out for the mugs going forward, like this guy, um, I'll be able to do, um, the sort of this woodish Polynesian glaze going forward, which hopefully looks slightly better. Um, I'll be able to do in two fires because I can do the base coat in underglaze on the greenware, fire yep. that once. And then the interior color and in what's going to go in the details would be the second fire and then I'm, I'm good. Um, as opposed to having to do three or four or whatever fires for stuff. Um, you know, having some level of both control and efficiency was, you know, kind of important because it's, it's a lot of time that goes into them. Um, so if you can speed up some pro part of that process, but get exactly the result you're looking for, it's kind of a win-win. I, I love that Polynesian mug, the, uh, the Polynesian glaze. I obviously begs the question, uh, Polynesian, your favorite resort? Ooh. Um, oh, that's hard. Um, so we own um, 
were like DVC members yeah. at um, at the Animal Kingdom Villas. Okay. Have you ever been to that hotel, the lodge, the Animal Kingdom Lodge? Uh, that is one of the only hotels <clears throat> I haven't been to, which crushes the, my soul, but oh, yeah, the, my cat. The, Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> He's going for the tiki What's mode. So. <laughs> is he a Maine Coon? That's a big fella. He's not. He's just, uh, this is the one that likes the cocktail straws. <laughs> it's sugary syrups. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, if you can get there sometime, whenever we can all get there again, um, which I'm assuming will happen, um, that hotel is just beautifully designed. Like, it's just amazing. It's, it's like a work of art. Yep. Um, I can't even describe the detail in that place. So we own there. Um, a lot of times we like to stay at the Grand Floridian because it's right next to the Polynesian. Um, and, you know, it's like a nice quick walk over and it's kind of convenient to get, every, get to everything. Yep. And we stay at the boardwalk a lot because we love. See, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, the beer tour of Epcot. You know, we I, like the I back door. I am ashamed. <clears throat> or I'm not really ashamed. I should be ashamed because, you know, search for Tiki or whatever. Yeah. I think my favorite resort area yeah. would be the boardwalk yeah. beach club it's really it's just good. so stylized yeah. and it's yeah. a fun place yeah and is it really the only way um i was going to do this before uh covid and everything but you stay there then you yep. can actually eat at all the restaurants at epcot yep yep because yep. otherwise there's like yep. 30 restaurants at epcot and i don't yeah. want to spend 30 days at epcot so no. i'm not eating at all those places yeah no and you can just pop over right you just be like oh where do we want to eat tonight and we just you'd run over and yeah or for food and wine too because that'll kill you uh, <laughs> so the other thing we like about wardwalk is that it has like basically the only quiet pool you can find on the property there's like actually there's two of them there but there's like one pool that we go to that like no one knows about no one really goes to so it's like the only place that there's not like a, a pool party, yeah. you know, with like with like uh, Radio Disney blasting every time you're there. So it's uh, we we do like that one. But the really get to the the Animal Kingdom Lodge and the villas, like the design of those places is mind blowing. Um, it just yeah, just the detail that go that went into everything there is is awesome. Uh, it's a little out of the way. It's good for the obviously you're going to Animal Kingdom, which is my favorite park easily um it's convenient for that but it's kind of a haul for everything else yeah um, especially but the magic kingdom but yeah the restaurants oh, yeah. there are amazing though uh absolutely amazing like they're they're kind of signature place Jico is like incredible and then they have one uh called sana at the the villas um which is sort of indian inspired like they have the best yep. bread service spreads like naan um, and papadam and like that kind of thing. Um, like the food is awesome. Like it's in, and they have this like great wine list cause it's all sort of South African wines. It's yeah, it's a lot of fun over there. And there's basically no place on else on earth that you're gonna be sitting, drinking like rum and crushed ice next to a pool where there's like a baby giraffe running. Yeah. Next. Like it's crazy. Like it's, it's absolutely nuts. Like we were having, um, we we're having lunch. I think we were at Sanaa. I'm not sure. Where we or I had an ostrich steak. Okay. Which tastes like tuna, right? It tastes like almost like raw tuna. In um, steak form. Yeah, yeah, and like little. Um, and there was a, literally an ostrich outside the window. <laughs> so I felt a little That's guilty. An interesting but then spin. I, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's a wild place. Like it's because both buildings are um, built around sort of savanna. They have pendant areas. Yeah, I think they sort of connect between the two buildings, uh, which are kind of U shaped. The 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 villas are definitely sort of U shaped, um, and they sort of are angled towards each other a little bit. But they have, you know, they have cattle uh, like African oxen and the giraffes and like all the stuff just out there roaming freely. Um, which is just, it's, yeah, it's wild. It's, I mean, it's, you could just go and stay there for a week and like have enough to do. It's nuts. I got to do that. I got to do that yeah. one. I haven't done wilderness. Um, oh, I, wilderness I, is fun. I avoided the fancy <clears throat> restaurants for the longest time just because yeah. I felt like I would be uncomfortable there. And usually oh, you go to a fancy restaurant, you pay a yeah. lot of money, you get a tiny portion. I'm like, eh, it's not really my scene. Yeah. But I started doing it the last couple of times. There are some incredible restaurants. 
That's that's like we. I, I'm a big food guy. I don't know if you've seen in my stories. I oh yeah, um, and that's where it started because we would go down, and that's where I you know first started going to restaurants that were, um, you know, beyond I don't know Subway, um, and I think California Grill was like the first like, this is a fancy restaurant that I can remember going yeah. to. Um, but it's kind of one of the places that I learned about food and the food down there is good. Like it is legit. Um, and it's, you know, but it's Disney too. Like if you're going to, you can go to the fanciest restaurant there and there'll be a dude next to you in a Mickey Mouse t-shirt with like- That's what I love. With beats on, you know, it's, it's fine. It gives with, you the opportunity to, to have uh, really exquisite food without yep. the uncomfortability yep. 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 that yep. you have yep. at fancy restaurants literally yep. anywhere else in the world. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. The other thing that, that Gretchen and I do is because there's just two of us, right? If you're two people and you're uh, at a table in a busy restaurant, your service is going to be so-so. So we always go sit at the bar. So if we mm -hmm. go to like any of these places, Citrico's or Gico or whatever, we go sit at the bar because the bartender will take care of you. And the food is the same. <laughs> yeah. So you can just go sit there and order everything. That's that's the thing that we like to do. But yeah, the food is... is tricks all, of the it, trade. Tricks of the trade. <laughs> it's so many places down there. The food is fantastic. Just fantastic. One more question. Yeah. And I'll let you go. And we'll do these giveaways. Um, you're doing a... I don't know what you call it. I, I only would know how to call it the Enchanted Tiki Bar Window. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Will we be able to get our hands on that eventually, or are you keeping yes. that to yourself? Yep, yep, no, no. Uh, there's, so there's, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do it. There's a couple different, like, since we've all been trapped inside, this idea of having, like, some sort of ambient window view that you can yep. just change to be different places um, has kind of been super interesting to me. So there's some that I'm doing for me that like, I don't think anybody's going to give a crap about. Like I'm doing one that's um, like San Francisco in like 1950 or something. So it just looks oh, like- Oh yeah, I remember seeing some, some things yeah, in the story yeah. about so, that, yep. So like there's stuff like that that I don't think anybody but me is going to care about. But the, the window itself is definitely, because I was thinking, you know, when, when the, the lockdown sort of first started, everybody was putting that one Trader Sam's window that's on YouTube up. Um, yep. That has, you know, it has the rain and the volcanoes and whatever, and that somebody went in and like, cut out the volcano and After Effects and put some clouds or whatever behind. And it's awesome. I, like I have it in the studio all the time when I'm working. But I was like, what if you were to do something like this that would be interactive? And you just plug it into the back of the TV and have like a little um, remote so that, you know, like when they do the uh oh, uh, you can yeah. push a button and, and something will happen. And um, I was like, it's a good idea. I'm not sure if I can figure it out, right? Technically, I'm not sure if I can figure it out. And I started messing around with like, I have one somewhere. Um, so like this is like one of the little boards that the program will go on. Okay. Right? So... It's a board like this, and actually the one that I'm gonna wind up using would be smaller than this, that has like a little HDMI port, plugs into your TV, and has a little thing that picks up remote signals, and then stores the video on it, right? So it would just have some loops of palm trees and clouds and whatever, and if you'd wanna trigger rain or volcanoes or whatever, it would have just a animation that it would go to to play that when you push a button on the remote. So I was like, all right, this would be awesome. I don't know if I can do it, right? It turns out the programming is really simple. Um, okay. So I figured that out and got that part of it working. And then I was like, can I figure out how to make the trees blow in the wind and make the water ripple and make the volcano have smoke and all that stuff. And with all that stuff in 3D, there's like 20 different ways to do anything. Um, but I wanted to see if I could figure it out. And for a while, I was not sure I would be able to grasp it, but I have figured out technically a lot of it. So mm -hmm. yeah, at some point, I, I think this is going to be like a one-year project. Yeah. At some point next year, yes. It's like, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out now is like, I know I can do the graphics part of it. I know I can do the programming part of it. 
Do I want to get into like, it comes with a bamboo frame that you hang over your TV? You know what I'm saying? Like what size is it? Is it an adjustable bamboo frame? I have no idea. So I think it might just be the thing that plugs in. Um, but the frame would be cool because one of the other things that you can do with this is run a bunch of LEDs into it. So it could actually trigger, if you had a home bar, it yep. could actually trigger lighting effects in your home bar. You know, or if you wanted to have just lighting effects built into the frame, it could do that. Um, so if you do the, like the OA thing, or if you do like, um, um, like when they do the, the Nautilus um, yeah. uh, drink, and the lights go blue, right? And they, I think they might project like bubbles or waves or something over the room or whatever. You could have lights in the frame or around the thing that, you know, send out some kind of effect like that. Do you know um, if you're able to, does Philips Hue allow developers or are they closed? I don't know. I would bet that they're closed, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I would bet that they're closed, but I have no idea. Uh, but that would be, yeah, if you could have something that, that would be a whole other level. Like the programming for what I'm using is like dirt simple. Um, yeah. That would get into like whatever the Philips API is. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you could get this thing to talk to that. I have no idea. This like literally would be like, play some video files, flash some lights. You know, it's not, it's not super complicated as long as you can get the graphic part of it to work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I'm definitely doing that. And then the other thing that I was hoping to get, I, I'm gonna keep asking people, is that um, I wanna do the, the, you know, the Trader Sam's window style thing with the volcano and the palm trees and everything. But I also wanna do something that looks like classic tiki bars that have disappeared. Like, could you recreate yeah. like the Washington DC Trader Vix in the fifties and make it look like the inside of that or, you know, something, stuff like that. So if you wanted to switch it to something else or switch it around, um, I thought that would be, be fun since there's so many great, you know, classic bars that you see on like Critique or whatever that just yep. aren't there anymore, you know, or like somebody posted one, um, what is his name? There's a guy that is local to us. I think he's in, in, he might be in Beverly. He might be the next town over for me. Okay. Um, who is a big Whitco collector, but he posted some stuff that he found for this tiki bar that was in Chinatown in Boston in the sixties. And I was like, I've never heard of this place. And I looked at pictures of the inside of the place and I'm like, this is amazing. And so many of these places are gone. Like just don't exist anymore. Yep. You know, could you, could you kind of rebuild them or rebuild something similar to them to, you know, so that you could swap around and, and based on like uh like an old photograph and then kind of, yeah, yeah, like yeah. A 3D like, kinda... um, yeah. Like if you look at, or um, there's a lot, there's a ton on, um, on, well, I mean, critique is a good one, but there's a ton on like uh, whatever flicker people scanning old uh, postcards yeah. of the places so you get kind of old postcards are so bad because they're just like here's a shot and here's another shot of this place and they're like just kind of jammed next to each other with a white bar between them but <laughs> they give you like a couple different angles of the place just if, with like nobody in it um it would be fun to kind of like rebuild some of that stuff so that you could have like you know i want to be at the you know whatever the tonga hut in 1950 or, or whatever tonight um talk about so that's nostalgia. one thing yeah, I would love to put that in, you know, I'd love to have like, it just be mostly uh, the Trader Sam's window kind of thing, but have a couple of, of tiki bars that you could throw in if you wanted to. So it seems like it'd be fun. But at some point, this is after, you know, I get the mugs kind of rolling, and I'm getting up to speed on doing that. Yep. Um, this is the next thing. This is I, when I'm not working on that. This is what I'm working on right now. So it will be real at some point. It's going to take a little while. I love it. There are so many tiki bars, home tiki bars out there. That yeah, would kill for something like that. And especially these days, you know, where you're, we're at home a lot, and it seems like uh, working from home, at least most of the time, is going to be the normal for a while. For a while, uh, probably forever. You know, this. I think this is a change, right? Um, you know, having or, you know, especially with with having Disney closed, having or you know, having been closed for a while and me not necessarily feeling safe going there right now. Um, a lot of people I think would like to have like a little piece of that at home just whenever you want to. I don't know. Like I get through my day. I was talking to, to somebody about this yesterday. Um, I get through my day by playing background music loops from, from Disney world in the yep. studio. Like that's how I work every day. 
you know, it's just that little kind of piece of, of escape. Um, yeah, I, don't know. I think it would be cool to be. Would you add music to it? Uh, probably not. Like I go back and forth on that, but like, I would rather people have the, the choice to play their own stuff. Cause like, I don't know how many Spotify playlists you have of like, you know, ambient background stuff. I've got like a million, so yeah. I don't know. It, I mean, it could be an optional thing. Um, I don't know what that technically would mean, but um, it could be either, either way. But then that's like, that's like a whole licensing thing, right? Like yeah. you'd have to, you'd have but to. There is it. a way. I'm a big chilled cow guy. I don't know if you know chilled cow. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I love yeah. chilled yeah. cow. Yeah. All of those yeah, things. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if there's a tiki one. Not that I've seen. But if someone's yeah. if someone's watching this and has a lot of time on your hands because of the pandemic, make yeah. a tiki chilled cow, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, that was yeah. If something like or is something like I mean, I'm sure a lot of the artists on playlists like that would be okay with like you know loaning out or licensing their music for not crazy amounts. But like, if I was trying to do like a Les Baxter like soundtrack oh yeah probably probably not gonna work probably i'm just gonna have to play that off of spotify you know so it would also be cool to get um you know get some some musicians to write some new stuff for it like um, trader brandon what yeah yeah Did you see that uh, I, I don't know if we can get michael Giancino to work <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i don't think he's gonna be working on this but uh that would be pretty sweet that'd be pretty sweet um, I don't know anybody who does that style of music. Like I know musicians, but I don't know anybody who does anything even vaguely uh, Tiki, Exotica, surf rock, whatever related. Um, I don't know, it would be a neat way to go with it. I was mostly thinking, no, it would just be, you know, sound effects and, and, and whatever the visual effects were. And uh, you could put on whatever you wanted to listen to, but. You never know. I don't know. It, it might evolve. We got time. It's yeah, I got we plenty got time of time to plant it's, that seed. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. <laughs> but I'm, I'm working on it every day. So it's, it will get there at some point. I love seeing the progress, man. Um, it has been fantastic talking to you. Thank you. It's been great talking to you, finally. You're the closest artist to me. It feels so good <laughs> to uh, talk to someone in my neck of the woods. I know. It's Everybody, like, I, I don't know if people ask you this all the time. People are like, are you in California? No. I'm not in California. I don't usually. I, get, I see. They usually California. assume I live in California. Yeah. But then as soon as I post a photo of Kowloon, ah. that's when I get the messages, and they're like, "Wait a second, did you yeah. take that photo?" Kowloon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love Kowloon, man. That's and that's funny too. Is that that's like the 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 Grog Grotto and the Smuggler's Code book were kind of like what got me doing this, but I got into it for uh, uh, you know for a little while, and I was like wait, I remember all these Chinese restaurants up here were basically tiki bars. And then we started to go to Kowloon again. And I was like, this is awesome. Yep. So, oh God, I love Kowloon. It's the only thing we got. So we yeah. got to cling to it. <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. Yeah. It's been fantastic, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. I, uh, I won't make you sit through the giveaways because we got a bunch to do tonight. Uh, okay. but, but thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we get to chat soon. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Take it easy. All right, everybody. The moment you've all been waiting for. Let me pull this up. We're giving away a few things. We have the Enchanted Tiki Drummer Box, um, which is the carving contest. And then we also have these terribly spooky Club 33 Haunted Mansion busts. So bear with me one second. If I can pull up the photos. So the way this is going to work, the carving contest, we had so many awesome entries, truly. I don't know. I don't even know how to choose. Um, but so third and second place, they will get a set of our uh, Naughty Cat Mai Tai glasses. We'll ship those out to you um, as a thank you for entering. You get uh, one of each color. Uh, glass, you get 10 cocktail umbrellas, and you get the recipe card. So we'll start with number three, which was submitted by Emmy100122. This one right here, which of course, we love Moana. Uh, 
So that was a really cool pumpkin to see. You're going to be getting a set of Mai Tai glasses. Number two. was by Todd G, this fantastic thing. And he actually sent me a second photo of this like two days later, it like rotted away because I think he's in California right away. And it looks sick rotted too, which is a testament, but it's got these like tentacles. That's so much work. Um, you will also be getting a set of the Naughty Cat Mai Tai glasses. Fantastic design. Um, I wish I could show you all of these. They're on Facebook, they're on Instagram. You guys can check them out. The number one winner um, of this box, I'll show it to you. Yeah. Ta-da! Enchanted Tiki Drummer Box is this bad boy, which was crazy. Um, this was by John Miller, 4574. He sent a bunch of different entries. Um, all of them were insane. I don't even know how you do that with pumpkins, but that's so cool. That's so many pumpkins. That's like 8,000 pumpkins. So congratulations. You got the Enchanted Tiki Drummer Box. We will be sending that your way. And now, the time to give away the coveted Club 33 Haunted Mansion Tiki busts. We had a ridiculous number of entries. It had the most response of any giveaway we have ever done yet. So thank you guys so much. 13 Nights of Tiki Frights has been amazing. Um, the search for Tiki passed 500,000 views in six months. It's like 83,000 views a month. I could never have imagined that when we started working on this website. Thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been unbelievable. I can't believe I've been able to talk to all these artists over the past 13 days. So many amazing artists. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check out the videos, please do. Hopefully we get to do this again in the future. And without any further ado, I'm going to use a random number generator to determine who, who gets the mugs. This person will receive both mugs. Um, doesn't feel right to separate them, really. So there's only one winner, and they'll get both. Of course, it's another name that I will not pronounce correctly, <laughs> which has, has, I think that's happened to me every single night this week, but that's okay. Club 33, Haunted Mansion bus, our biggest giveaway yet, goes to Lisa Llewellyn. I'm sure I got your name, last name wrong, but congratulations. <laughs> Guys, it has been so amazing to talk to all these artists to have all your support on the search for tiki uh halloween was a little weird this year but you made it uh, extremely memorable for me i will never forget it thank you so much and uh thank you jay for joining us tonight have a good night everyone